You're listening to Dare to Transform, where we find the vision, dedication, and motivation behind inspiring stories of transformation. This is episode number three, Learning to Fight and Find Your Way. I'm your host, Angela Harris, founder of Work of Heart, bringing you a Missing Link Technologies production. My guest today is someone who I've known for a very long time, the one and only Nick Sulsky. Nick is currently the president of Monkey Knife Fight, the fastest growing daily fantasy sports company on Earth. Earth. Nick has worked with some of Canada's biggest brands, ranging from TSN, CBC, and Rogers to the CFL, Puma, and the Atlantic Ballet of Canada. His current leadership position in the sports gaming industry was fostered while consulting with TSN when he created and co-hosted the Fantasy Hockey Report on TSN.ca, the first broadband fantasy sports show. He is a frequent interactive digital media emergency emerging technology panelist, lending his expert opinion in the developing category of multi-screen gaming and entertainment. Nick is also a cancer fighter, diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma in 2009. Nick continues to kick its butt day in and day out with a regimen of exercise, nutrition, positivity, and good old-fashioned, screw you, stubbornness. Nick, welcome to Dare to Transform. Thank you for having me. You forgot one very important thing Uh-oh. from my bio. Yes. Work of work of heart speaker. Come on now. Yes, yes, you exactly. Stay on brand here, right? I know. I think you probably have like that. That's probably at the top of your resume right now, right? Well, I have updated my resume since coming to the beautiful city <laughs> last month. I hear you. I hear you. So I would love if you could share a bit of an introduction of yourself. I mean, I did your bio, but it would be awesome if you could tell us who you are, you know, what you do today, how you got started, um, that kind of thing. So the audience has a better idea of who Nick really is. (laughs) Well, I hope this is a long podcast. I mean, ultimately, (laughs) so I I guess the the question, the question, Angela, and do you prefer Angela or Scrange on this podcast? Oh, yes. Well, see, we probably need to explain to them what Scrange was. (laughs) Oh, so Scrange is a... is a mysterious ancient yes it's a mysterious nickname that a lot of people in the business world don't know about so there you go so (laughs) i i will i will i will shed the veil of mystery we we for all of your lovely listeners out there the two of us became acquainted at the incredible mount allison university Um, i won't i won't say what years because then that would date us and i i wouldn't even be able to tell you what they were in fact (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> exactly. And the two of us both played rugby. And of course, when you played rugby, you had nicknames. And exactly. Um, yours was Scrange and mine, um, because I was the lone Jewish rugby player in <laughs> Mount Allison, and perhaps one of the only Jewish people at Mount Allison at the time, to be quite candid, my nickname uh, kind of played around that motif. I think Goldberg right. is probably the most popular one. <laughs> I-, I like to think it was because of the wrestler. Back in right. the 90s, he was big and had a goatee, right, and strong. Yeah, absolutely. But I don't think that's what they were. No, no. I should, I should inject and say that um, by no means is this meant to be a, like, totally unedited, uncensored <laughs> podcast, right? <laughs> yes, I, I do. I do swear. So to all of your listeners out there, yeah, yeah. I will uh, apologize in advance because I fucking swear like a trailer sometimes. <laughs> Hey, so, there we go. First step bomb. Boom. So I, I think the question, the question, and, and for the sake of this podcast, I will call you Scrange just because yes. I don't know what my brain would do if I had to shift I know, that. right? Yes. So let me ask the question again. Sure. So tell me a little bit. Let's talk about entrepreneurship. Yep. Um, and I will ask you a few more questions as we go along about your cancer fight and how that all has impacted your life. Does that sound good? Sounds perfect. Okay. So, awesome. entre- so it's funny. Entrepreneurship, I think, I mean, it's kind of nature versus nurture, right? I think some yeah. people are born with it and some people aren't. And I think being born with it, for me, uh, for me, it was um, no, like lack of fear. Right. Being able to accept the fact that you're going to get no's and not being scared just to do shit. So, you know, my story really literally begins as soon as university ended. Um, I graduated Mount A and I was fortunate enough to play in something called the Maccabee Games, which is the Jewish Olympics. And I played rugby for Canada. Um, This was literally right after I graduated Mount A. And of course, the Mm -hmm. whole plan was grad school. I was going to be a lawyer and all that kind of stuff. 
right. I went to the Maccabee games and and um, I realized right after university that I wasn't my head was my heart wasn't really in going right to grad school. So I ended up meeting some Australians um, who were also playing rugby and they convinced me to go to Australia and play rugby with them. So I was like, all right. So I, I decided to go to Australia, take the year off. Um, and Australia is a great backpacking country. And so the idea was I'll go play rugby and then I'll go backpacking. Got to Australia and about after three weeks of playing rugby down there, I realized that being a, a, a fairly decent Canadian rugby player means you're a pretty shitty Australian rugby player. <laughs> And, I was just gonna say, yeah, yeah, and ultimately the idea of you know dedicating five hours, you know, four five days a week to a sport where I was now like third, fourth division, I wasn't really, I was making money or anything. I was like, ah, screw this. But Australia was great, and to be completely right. candid, Australians, Australian, I was twenty one. Australian women like Canadian men. Um, yes, there you stop. go. So I was like, yeah, I think I might have some fun and travel around the country a little bit. So basically my father, I, I had to get a job, right? So right. My, my my father um, works in the clothing industry. And so I've never done anything in the clothing industry at that point. But I was like, ah, I've heard my dad talk in meetings and stuff like that. Oh, I'll try and get a job in a clothing store. So I I, I got at a meeting um, with, with a spree, which was a, a clothing label. It's not really around much anymore. Um, and I, whatever, talked myself into becoming a salesperson for them. So, um, nice. I was one of the only guys selling, and it was a female only clothing chain at the time. So I started selling clothes in Australia and I ended up basically traveling wherever I needed to go. I would just go and pick up hours at different stores. After about seven months there, um, I moved to Perth. I started in Sydney, moved my way over to Perth. And by the time I got to Perth, the people at Esprit were like, well, why don't you want to manage one of our stores? We really like you. And I was like, Okay. But then about three weeks later, I was like, I'm a backpacker. I don't want responsibility. So right. I quit that job and then I got another job working for, but that, you know, ultimately, you know, that that's kind of got my brain into, oh, you can kind of do whatever you want to do. If you're able to talk, if you're confident mm -hmm. in yourself and you Absolutely. have a goal, you know, you basically, you just got to convince people that to give you a chance. And then you have to prove right. to them that you um, are what you said you were. So I, I ended up, uh, you know, I finished my Australian trip. I still wasn't ready for what I, you know, what I wanted to do with my next career. So I went and I became a ski bum for a year in Mont Tremblant in, in Quebec. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and at that point, I was, you know, after traveling, I was very into writing and thinking about getting into television and film. Um, but, you know, I didn't know how to do it. Um, so, you know, I was I was working in Tremblant, uh, ironically managing a, a video store. I think mm -hmm. I did that because I love the movie Clerks and there's a, a character in that movie <laughs> called Randall who manages the video store. And I think if anyone has seen that movie Clerks, I kind of yeah. patterned my life after some of the Kevin Smith's banter at that point. Um, but anyway, so I'm managing That's the video awesome. store, working at Trombley, and one day, I literally one day, I'm, I'm on a chairlift. And yeah. I'm, as you can probably get a sense, Scrange, you've known me for a long time. Your listeners have now heard me for about six or seven minutes. I talk a lot. Mm. Um, and I, I'm not scared to ever. talk. So, yeah. Ever. <laughs> so I'm, and by all means, tell me to slow down or to, or to shut up if I'm rambling on too much. Um, but I'm on a chair. I would never do that. Oh, I, well, <laughs> I'm I, I think you've yelled at me a couple of times, I, but I'm pretty sure it was probably okay. at two 30 in the morning and it probably involved <laughs> getting, kicking me out of a bar or something like that. Um, so, you know, ultimately, you know, I was on a chairlift one day and I just, you know, uh, randomly had a, started having a conversation with these two ladies who were on the chairlift and they asked me what I wanted to do with my life. And I told them, oh, I'm really into writing. I, I kind of like the idea of getting into film and television. And they ended up being, um, I think they were Canadian producers of television. They said, oh, have you ever heard of the Canadian Film and Television Production Association, something called the CFTPA? And I was like, no. And they said, well, they run a program that's funded through Heritage Canada to allow young people to get internships at a number of different organizations across the country. And, I, and they, they said, you should look into that. And I was like, that sounds good. So I looked into that. Ultimately, I ended up getting an internship at a, through that conversation. I ended up getting an internship at a place called the Canadian Screen Training Center in Ottawa. Um, and so that was the beginning of... of <laughs> Of what my of uh, of what I usually only refer to this with my wife, but now I've started making it a little bit more public. Kind of my life business philosophy, which is something called harness the randomness. Right. You never know what's going to happen in life, who you're going to talk to, what so you're going to hear. But if you're if you're the kind of person that's open minded and not scared to say no or not scared to kind of just ask questions or talk to people, you have no idea what one conversation can lead to or what one 
meeting could lead to or what one idea could lead to. So, you know, that was kind of the, the beginning of, of all of this and it, it, and it's transferred into Ottawa. So at that point, I moved to Ottawa. I've been doing an internship at a place called the Canadian Screen Training Center. Um, it wasn't, you know, I was just kind of organizing stuff and helping the marketing people. Um, uh, one day I was organizing or helping to, to pr- helping to put together a kids television production seminar. And it was being hosted yep. by uh, two producers of Degrassi Junior High, Kathy Lee Porter and Virginia Thompson. Um, I think they may have actually been the creators of Degrassi Junior High as well. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Anyway, my job during this seminar was to just wrangle. They had a kids focus group, like a focus group of a bunch of like six to 10 year olds. I grew up in a I grew up in a big family. I went to sleepaway camp my entire life. I worked at sleepaway camp. I've always loved kids. I absolutely yeah. love kids. So I was just kind of keeping the focus group entertained and making them comfortable and making the kids be, you know, um, be, 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 you know, a feeling um, uh, open enough to kind of participate in this focus group. At the end of the focus group, the two producers came up to me and they said, hey, that like, who are you? What, what, what do you want to do in, in, in this life? Uh, what do you want to do in television and film? And I said, I don't really know. You know, I, I at that point, like I said, I was addicted to Kevin Smith and that's a sort of witty banter. So, of course, in my mind, I was I had illusions of grandeur of writing the next great kind of indie comedy. Um, yeah. And they said, well, you should, you know, what about kids television? You're really great with kids. What about, mm-hmm. what about doing something like that? And I was like, hmm, that's kind of interesting. And literally I was walking home from that, from that seminar after listening to what they had suggested to me. And I came up with an idea for a kids television show. And, and I was like, hmm, okay, this is a pretty good idea. And I started telling some people about this idea. The lesson that I learned at that point that they told me Yes. That literally has rang true from a television production perspective is good content is produced by people who are passionate about what stories they want to tell. So I absolutely so that I, applies I, to everything. A hundred percent. If you're right? uh, I'm, I'm an extraordinarily passionate person and people people want to buy things from passionate people because mm-hmm. they if I mean, it's going to sound 100%. a little bit it's, it's going to sound bullshit. But if people think if you're passionate about something, whether it's real passion or fake passion, people are going to buy into that a hell of a lot more because if they think that you actually believe what you say, well, obviously you're a way better salesman in that perspective. I mean, ultimately I, I'm, I also put all my cards on the table. I'm blunt. I don't Mm -hmm. believe in bullshit. If I'm selling something that you don't like, well, I mean, sorry, I I can't sell something I don't like because it will, it will be extraordinarily obvious. Um, I, I, I can't handle bullshit. It's just, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. So at that point, you know, I'm walking home. And as I just said, I grew up in sleepaway camp. I'm walking home. I'm like, oh, sleepaway camp. That's an awesome, that's an awesome experience. I think there should be a television show made about the experiences of kids at sleepaway camp. So, so I I came up with this idea and I started talking to people about it. And everyone was like, yeah, it sounds like a really good idea. So I I was able to raise some money, um, do this to this television show um, through some family and friends, my father, especially. I mean, the reality is. Most great entrepreneurs, for whatever it's worth, I should say most, many entrepreneurs who get started um, for whatever, you know, they, they, a lot of them do have support from their family. I mean, the reality is I, I have so much respect for entrepreneurs that literally do it from scratch with no support mm-hmm. from their family, their parents. Yeah. Their friends. I mean, ultimately, you know, what I do now has nothing to do with that, but I got started because my father and some of his friends believed in my idea and were willing to help me get started. Incredible. But here's the thing, Nick, here's the thing, Nick. So, yeah, yeah. you know, a couple things that you've said so far, um, and you know, there are things that I talk about a lot too. I think that, you know, it's, first of all, it's about creating your own opportunities, totally. right? Like, and it's about like having, you know, when you have an idea, it's talking about it and letting yourself like imagine the possibilities of it and then keeping like regardless of how you're going to do it or who's going to help you do it like don't you know don't stop talking about it or thinking about what it could possibly be because you don't know how it's going to happen well I think right like some people have like some people have you know family and you know access to money or connections or whatever some people don't but at the at the end of the day it, you might be sitting on a chairlift in Tremblant and all of a sudden the person next to you has the the money connections opportunities yep. access or whatever it is that you need right well i think i think that's the key the key isn't the money the key no. is the the 
The key is the willingness to put your ideas out there. Because right. the reality is, an idea you're going to put out there into the world, there's going to be a lot of people who think it's a bad idea, straight up. Absolutely. And you, you need to have thick skin. Ultimately, mm -hmm. the, the other, you know, the other characteristic that I think is extraordinarily important, both for an entrepreneur, but also for any leader, because the reality is any entrepreneur mm -hmm. is a leader, right? Absolutely. They need to evolve themselves into that. And any good leader, especially in this day and age, when you're trying to grow business, needs to understand what their weaknesses are. And it's right. not only weaknesses of, of, of what their, you know, you know, everyone has strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. It's in what they're good at, and what they're not good at. But ideas also have strengths and weaknesses, right? So right. you might have, you might put an idea out in there into the world, and it's not that everyone that have that has any negative impressions about that idea are commenting on the idea as a whole. But there might be elements of that idea where, as people are critiquing that or I mean, criticizing. Mm -hmm word but you're going to be able to make that idea better or or shift it or or let it grow into what it will eventually become so right. ultimately i think that you know becoming a successful entrepreneur yes there's a lot of you know characteristics that you need to be able to foster within yourself i mean chief and i mean it's confidence right and not yeah. be scared no i mean ultimately yeah. if you're gonna if you're not if you want to be an entrepreneur you need to accept the fact that 95% of the responses you're going to get from people are going to be no. Raise, I've raised money a number of times. I've pitched television shows before my new career, like hundreds of times. And the reality is you get no 95% more than you get yes. Well, and I think, you know, I spent, I spent 17 years in corporate sales. So, I mean, I got really used to hearing no and like getting beat up and, you know, dealing with objections like real and imaginary ones. And I think, I don't necessarily think it gets easier, um, but it gets easier to pick yourself up faster, right? Like when someone yes. is like, or it gets easier to recognize when something is real or if somebody's just like trying to, you know, get you out the door. Right. But I think that's a, you know, it's a and, key to to being successful in all of this. And I, and I don't and I don't necessarily know. I don't know if I agree. I don't know if it's easier. Like mm -hmm. I, I, I a lot of my life, I model after my experience playing sports. Right. Me too. So you watch watch LeBron James after he loses a basketball game. Right. How many basketball games has he won? Hundreds, thousands. Mm -hmm. How many championships has he won? Look at Michael Jordan. I mean, case in point. He loses a game. He's pissed off. It's not right. easy. No. Right? When I lose, when I get told no, I'm pissed. I'm angry. I'm upset. Mm -hmm. Is it mm -hmm. easier for me to accept? I, it, it may be easier for me to get over it. But right. the moment is not easy. The moment is never easy. And the moment that... Whenever that moment is easy, then you know you're fucked because yeah. you never want losing or getting no. a no to be easy. What you That's, want. I love is... that. <laughs> Nick's like, wait, what, what did I say? What did I yeah, say? Yeah. Oh, no, no. I, I, <laughs> I no, remember. I, what it, no. <laughs> listen, I, I love that you went to sports because that's how I'm wired too, right? And everything, you know, that I do either in business or that, you know, in my previous career or even with my family, like it all comes down to sports for me and that like, so I love that analogy. And I think you're right. Like when, when you, it's, I don't like losing. I don't, no. I, don't I don't like, no, I don't, I don't like it at all. But I think that you get smarter as you yep. get older, you get smarter as you like lose more, you know, again, to, back to the sports analogy and you, you have more takeaways, right? Like you, 100%. you learn, like you learn what you need to take from it. You know, I, when I think back to when I was playing sports, when I was playing rugby, when I was 20 versus when I was coaching, when I was 35, you know, the lessons are very different. Right. And I would, you know, definitely probably take a loss like harder and more personally when I was younger, but you're right. Like, I think it's like, it's figuring out what you need to learn from the thing, the no or the lesson or the, yep. the opportunity not working out the way that you wanted it to. That's so. right. Because you want to make that recovery from yes. the, from the inevitable no. Exactly. You need to accept the fact you're going to get told no a lot, right? but yeah. how to bounce back more efficiently, yeah. right? And, yeah. and, and more constructively. Right. Yeah. So, and you were a physical trainer. I mean, when somebody yeah. gets injured the first time you go and you help them get better, you help them recover. The yeah. next time they get injured, that person's going to know, oh, or there's steps they can take 
yeah. to prevent that next injury. You know what I right. mean? Like, yeah. oh no, every analogy I use is all about, I won't even get into my no. building a business through rugby because I believe <laughs> that rugby is the greatest analogy on how you want to build the right team and the yeah. right business because of the way that the sport of rugby is structured. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. we can, we can talk about well, no, that. And it, listen, <laughs> I talk about, I was just talking about this yesterday with somebody else actually about, you know, how a lot of people in business just want to like, they just want to go right to being an expert in this thing, or they want to, you know, they want to go do um, niche something or whatever. And I'm like, but some, it, it all starts with the basics. Right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I take that from my days as either rugby player or like playing sports, like you don't get really good at, you know, doing the finesse stuff unless you got the basics down. Right. Yep. And I think, and that applies to the business world too. And so, you know, again, you know, it depends on who you're talking to. Not everybody's into sports, but it, it definitely rugby definitely shaped who I am as a person and the business person that I've become too. Yeah. Well, I'll just, uh, I'll close the loop on, on that analogy is, you know, the, mm -hmm. reaz the reason why, to me, rugby is such a great um, example on or the sport of rugby and how the team operates within a rugby game is within rugby. The, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with the sport, the game doesn't stop. Right. right. It's, it's a flowing game. Unlike football, where you could be an offensive lineman, you have your singular job that you know you have to do for 15 seconds. All you have to do is you need to pull and block the outside linebacker. That's your yeah. job. If you yeah. do that job, then your team can have success. Mm -hmm. In rugby, it doesn't work like that because the game doesn't stop. All 15 people on a rugby field need to be in sync with one another. They need to understand what each person's role is at every at any given time during the game, because as the game evolves, they need to be able to adapt and work together to score a try. It's not yeah. like as a rugby player, I have my one job to do over 15 seconds because the game is flowing. Everybody has to have their role, but also everybody has to be willing to adapt. It's like being an entrepreneur. You need to be willing to adapt. The best entrepreneurs that I've ever met are pseudo jack of all trades, masters yeah. of none, right? right you right. can be an incredible entrepreneur without being an expert in something. What Absolutely. you need to be aware of is you need to be, you need to be willing to be a part of a team. You need to be to identify other people that you want to play or work with, and you right. need to be willing to listen to them, to work with them and allow them to express their, you know, their strengths and mm -hmm. understand their weaknesses, right? If one person is strong, one person's fast, one person can catch, one person's not as great at catch. You know, you need to be able to work and, and, and flow together to be able yeah. to build a business or a team the right way. But anyway. Yeah, um, love it. So I yeah. didn't know this was going to go in a rugby direction, but I shouldn't e be, I shouldn't be surprised. <laughs> every, everything, every, oh, I mean, I work in sports now and I'm an obsessive rugby player. Oh, <laughs> a, 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 rugby sevens on CBC, 2.30 oh, Eastern. Awesome. That's <laughs> um, awesome. There you go. So there's the CBC plug for you. Um, so, so I mean, back to, you know, you know, basically, so I came up with that idea for here, I'm going to bring it all the way back full circle. I came up right. to the idea with that TV show about, about sleepaway camps, got some money, never did any TV show before, but I located and found people in Ottawa where I was living who had made TV shows before. And I convinced them to come and join me on this journey because I didn't know what I was doing. So I had right. to find other young people that could fit within the summer camp world to come with me. All right. along this journey. These people have all become some of my closest friends in the world. And this was back in 1999. Um, okay. So we're talking about over 20 years ago. Uh, so went off, we did this show, put together the first episode of the show. And I was like, oh, I got to go and sell it. So I literally, uh, I, I, was, I, I took a train from Montreal to Toronto to come and pitch all the TV stations. Yeah. Funny side note to this story, on the train from Montreal to Toronto to pitch my very first television show, uh -huh. train 5.30 in the morning, leaving to Toronto, I take a seat, uh, 10 minutes later, somebody walks onto the train, sits down next to me, and now she's my wife, um, that's how we met, and we've been I married for 15 years, yeah, so I met my wife, Lori, literally on the train, she came and sat down next to me, and I... We talked for about five, six hours, and now she's That's my wife. Amazing. So, so yeah, so so I came to Toronto, pitched my first television show, um, and there was uh, and it was a resounding no. Everybody yeah. gave me a no. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was twenty five at the time, twenty four at the time, and the way the Canadian I won't get into the reasons and the why as with the Canadian media system works, but effectively what I had done was I'd created a a, a show about what it's like in sleepaway camps. Okay. Um, 
uh, or, or, or it, the real life of sleepaway camps. I called this show a pop documentary. So I was pitching the show in the spring. Um, I forget what the year was. I think 2000, the spring of 2000. And this was, or maybe 2001. Um, and this was the spring before Survivor premiered in September. So wow. the term reality television didn't exist. So okay. nobody knew what the hell it was that I had done. They're like, what do you mean? What's a pop documentary? So of yeah. course, if reality television had already existed, I would have called yeah. it reality television. But because right. that, that show was turned down, but one of the people that I pitched the show to, uh, Family Channel, they said, hey, we, we, did, we can't, we, we're not going to air this show, but we're trying to figure out a way to rebrand our television station, come up with some ideas. So I came up with an idea for another television show, and they ended up buying it. And I ended up traveling. So it was, uh, I ended up traveling across country, me and two puppets, two big puppets, um, <laughs> two, and puppeteer. Love it. We yeah. took a jar of water from the Atlantic Ocean and we drove across the country to the Pacific Ocean to pour it in to see what would happen. We called it, it was it. called the family experiment. Um, it was inspired by What About Bob? I don't know if you remember What About Bob? Mm -hmm. He had a, his goldfish. Yeah. So, so I literally wore a, a jar of Atlantic Ocean water around my neck for a month driving across the country in a motorhome. Wow. Um, pup the, pu the, two pu the two puppeteers are still two of my closest friends. One of the puppeteers ended up leaving film and television got his master's of uh, theology from Trinity College, ended up marrying my wife and I. Um, so yeah, so then I did the Family Channel show for a while, uh, you know, did some production stuff. When I was doing the Family Channel stuff, this was there was a show on TSN at the time called Off the Record that was hosted by Michael Landsberg. Yes. And at that time, they had all these like B-level celebrities on the show. So at that point, I was whatever, probably a D-level celebrity, but I also played sports. And mm -hmm. as I've said before, I like to talk. So right. I- I am not scared of shit. So I called up or I emailed, I think I probably called the producer at this point. No, I emailed the producer of Off the Record and I said, hey, I'm on TV and I like sports. Can I do your show? And they said, sure. So yeah. I came and I did the show once. Make a long story short, um, they, they, they always like to have fighters or debaters on that show, people who would take the opposite angle of, of any topic. So I was like, I can do that, sure. So the amount of times I was on Canadian national television talking about how I think steroids would be good in sports as opposed to right. bad sports. Like, <laughs> yes, I would like to see a 600-foot home run. Who wouldn't want to see a 600-foot home run? I'm not taking steroids. I don't care. Anyway, I can't really believe that. Right. Drugs are bad kids. Um, but anyway, that's kind of what I did. So I started talking about sports on television. And, and then yeah. at this time, I was still making TV shows. And I was making brand. At that point, I started making like branded content for other companies like the Atlantic Ballet of Canada, like yeah. Puma, like Elections Canada. And I was uh, at that point, I was getting obsessed with something called fantasy sports. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with the producer of fantasy sports one day who also happened to be a fantasy sport or sorry, of off the record one day who also happened to be a fantasy sports fan. And I looked at her. I'm like, why don't like there? No one's doing a fantasy sports show. Like, why don't we do a show? Like, mm -hmm. let's do a fantasy. Swim. Well, well, we can do it right here. And the producer and I started talking and we realized we could like off the record shot for one hour. Right. Um, and but they had the crew in the studio for two hours, so the yeah. producer was like, and this was like his idea. I was like, well, why don't we can probably just shoot it right here with the same crew? And anyway, right. we pitched it to people at TSN. They're like, sure. And and so we we did. I did that for a couple of years, but that got me thinking about media and fantasy sports um, mm. and how those two things could play together. And so effectively, um, at that point, I came up with an idea of how to create a fantasy game or a fantasy product that would uh, allow broadcasters to increase the value of what they were offering on television. This was kind of in the early, this was around 2005, 2006, when people okay. you know, had their phones and their computers and people and broadcasters started thinking about, well, people are, there's TVs on, but they're also looking at their other screens called multi-screen right. entertainment, right. right? People are on Facebook or on Twitter when games are on, they're playing games with their phone. They're not necessarily, they're not necessarily watching the television advertising because ultimately television is driven by ad sales and sponsor sales, right? right? Yeah. Um, and it still is, even though that's stupid because nobody watches commercials anymore, but because the broadcast industry is so fucking antiquated and it's run by 70 year old people <laughs> that want to protect. How do you really feel, Nick? I hate it. I hate the broadcast world, especially the Canadian broadcast world because it doesn't give young people a chance. Be anyway, sorry, I I'm about to go off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, feel it back bringing in, Nick. We're bringing back. it back in. See, pre-married Nick would have just gone off, but I've been living with an incredible woman 
who's taught me that I need to bring myself. Thank you for listening to part one of Dare to Transform, episode three, Learning to Fight and Find Your Way. I'm Angela Harris, and this has been Dare to Transform, a Missing Link Technologies podcast in collaboration with Work of Heart. Have a great day.